Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. My name is Dr. Kirsten Ellenbogen. I'm president and CEO of Great Lakes Science Center, and I am your master of ceremony today for Great Lakes Hyperloop Press Conference. I'm delighted to be a part of this milestone event that began here a year ago at the Science Center with the signing of the official public-private partnership agreement between the Northeast Ohio Area-Wide Coordinating Agency and the Hyperloop Transportation Technologies to study a transformative system, bringing a fifth mode of transportation to reality. Today we are gathered here as guests, contributors, supporters, consortium leaders, and funders to hear the results of this feasibility study. We will hear from NOACA, Hyperloop TT, congressional representatives, and funding partners that have played a major role. Working together to convey successful findings that will give credence to not just a possibility, but a reality that the future of transportation is in Hyperloop. We will hear about how this region could develop the Hyperloop transportation system and how to make the Midwest mega region the global epicenter for this technology's development. So let's begin by introducing some very important guests to give remarks before releasing the study results. First to the stage, I would like to introduce Cuyahoga County Executive Armin Budish to give remarks, followed by Chief Valerie McCall, NOACA's Board President and Chief of Communications, Government, and International Affairs for the City of Cleveland. Please welcome Executive Budish and Chief Valerie McCall. Good morning. This is a crucial time for our county. It's time for us to think big, to trans transform our region. If we're going to attract, if we're going to grow businesses and jobs in this region, we can't simply do what everyone else is doing. We must separate ourselves from the pack in both our thinking and our actions. I just returned from a meeting of the most innovative, exciting county leaders from all over the country. The areas that are moving ahead are the ones that are thinking big. And I'm proud to say that that's what we're doing here. Over the past few months, we've announced some very big transformational ideas here in the county, like the Lakefront Access Plan, the Climate Change Action Plan, and the microgrid. The Hyperloop is another big game changer. The, I want to thank NOACA and uh, uh, Chief McCall, the president, and Grace Gallucci and her team for leading this effort. The 18-month Hyperloop trans, uh, feasibility study brought together more than 80 public and private organizations that provided support and resources for the study. Bringing together that kind of collaboration is how NOACA gets so much done for our region. The feasibility study provided some very interesting, very exciting insights. For example, Hyperloop can accommodate both the commuter and freight, freight expansion projected in the region for the next 25 years. Hyperloop would change the face of transportation. Imagine traveling from Cleveland to Chicago in less than an hour at speeds of over 500 miles an hour. The economic benefits could be in the billions, not millions, but billions of dollars. And we could see the creation of hundreds of thousands of new jobs. Does this sound like pie in the sky? Of course it does. But if we want to get a slice of that pie, we have to start thinking big. The same old, same old will get us just that. The same old, same old. The Hyperloop is the kind of thinking that can transform this region at hyperspeed. Again, I want to thank NOACA for leading this effort. All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. We're here to talk about something exciting. I know we're all awake already. It's Monday. 
The sun is shining and it's 70 degrees out. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, good morning, I'm Valerie McCall. I am the current per, uh, board chair for NOACA. Um, thank you very much, Executive Butish, who's our immediate past chair of NOACA. So if you can see the partnership, that's how we work together in this region. And it's an honor and a privilege to be here this morning on behalf of the city of Cleveland and on behalf of NOACA to speak about this great project. Um, as we all know that infrastructure and transportation creates a system of community connections and new opportunities for growth. On a national level, everybody's talking about mobility management and ways to think outside the box. Where well, I'm here to tell you today that this Hyperloop project is just that. Make no more mistake, this is transformative mobility management. There's a tremendous amount of excitement and interest in transportation technology in this region and nationally, and we are pleased to be working with so many wonderful partners to create the first mega region, we're gonna take credit for that one, and multi-regional project for a Hyperloop system. With routes from Cleveland to Chicago and Pittsburgh becoming a reality, it, this is unheard of. So bringing Hyperloop to our region would bolster economic growth, create jobs, strengthen Ohio's ability to travel, to travel across the region quickly and efficiently, and improve the daily lives of millions of Americans. And so the city of Cleveland is in support of the further studying the feasibility of this project, and we look forward to a continued partnership with our partners to bring this project to fruition. So with that, I'll say thank you and welcome. Please uh, join me in giving County Executive Butish and Chief McCall another round of applause for their support on this feasibility study. <laughs> Next, it gives me great pleasure to bring up our Hyperloop Transportation Technologies CEO, Andreas de Leon, who will be followed by NOACA's Executive Director, Grace Gallucci. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Elemogen. Uh, thank you, County Executive Bodies, uh, Chief McCall, Congresswoman Capture, Congressman Ryan, and thank you all of you for your support. Okay. It's a real pleasure to be here in Cleveland uh, to release to the public the first results of this feasibility study. This is the first step towards bringing this transformative technology transportation to Cleveland, Northeast Ohio, and to the Great Lakes region. The results of these studies are unprecedented. The study reveals and shows that Hyperloop is profitable and also brings massive economic benefit to the region. We are also very pleased for the support that we have had in this area. We have more than 80 companies and entities helping us including all the members of our Great Lakes uh, Hyperloop Consortium. We are here to build the Hyperloop in Ohio and by Ohio, okay? We really, you know, we really believe that there is a huge potential, a huge capabilities, huge tradition, huge industrial expertise in this area that we can use to build together, you know, the Hyperloop. So, there is also a reason we are here and we are not in other places in the world. And you know, it's the real close collaboration with NOAC under the leadership of Grace. Grace, thank you very much for your support. Thank you very much for everything that you have done for this project. And I would like, <laughs> and I would like personally congratulate uh, NOAC for his recent uh, MPO of the year award and for your continued support to the project. I would also like to do in an internal basis, you know, uh, I would like to thank uh, Andrea Lamendola, that has been the person in our organization that has been working hard to put all these uh, teams together and all this together. So it's clear that this is a, only a first step. We still have uh, work to do, okay? But we, at Hyperloop TT, we are very optimistic and we are very confident that we will be building the first Hyperloop in the United States in this region. Thank you very much to everybody.
Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and thank you for coming. Let me say from the outset that I have worked in the world of transportation for many years and many exciting projects in that time frame. But what we've embarked upon with the feasibility study for the Great Lakes Hyperloop is truly transformational. Hyperloop technology is real and achievable and we in Northeast Ohio have the chance to play a major role in making it a reality. And we are happy to be leading that effort. What the Hyperloop represents to Northeast Ohio is so, so much more than just speed and efficiency. It opens up our region to the rest of the Midwest, connecting us all in a network of technology and resources and people, which means jobs as well. I'm so very pleased that we've been able to form a working relationship with HTT, our feasibility study partner, and Thames, our consultant, to reach the major results that will be discussed later at the press conference. I would be remiss if I did not spend some time thanking our funding partners, for without you, the study would not have been possible. I'd like to start with thanking the Ohio Department of Transportation, the Ohio Turnpike and Infrastructure Commission, the Richard King Mellon Foundation, and finally, the Cleveland Foundation for their contributions to this effort. Let's give them a round of applause. I would also like to thank HTT for their true public-private partnership in funding and working through the details of the study with us. Thanks to all of our elected officials and NOACA Board of Directors. I appreciate the comments about me, but it's not about me. Uh, NOACA only moves forward, and particularly relative to the Hyperloop feasibility study, because we have board members who think big and who move the agency forward. They are the true visionaries who had the foresight and the ambition to believe that this transform transformative system would benefit our region and that we should capitalize upon it. I want to give a special thanks to U.S. Rep. Marcy Kaptur for all of your important work to help our project and to recognize and advocate the need for the Hyperloop for the Great Lakes, uh, Great Lakes Mega Region. It all started with conversations with HTT, Marcy Kaptur, and myself. Thank you. Uh, from the start of this project, our sentiment was, why not Cleveland? Why not? Cleveland was the first to build a municipal airport in the country back in 1925, Cleveland Hopkins International Airport. And I often say, Amelia Earhart was at the ribbon cutting ceremony. We have photo documentation of that. So Cleveland has always been pivotal, pivotal in transportation technology. We also are the home of Garrett Morgan, who invented the traffic light. So we're not afraid of new technology, um, and we still want to be the front runner. So this mode of transportation, based on the cur current feasibility stats, results positions us there. And to our regional MPOs and government commissions that hosted technical advisory committee meetings and stakeholder meetings throughout the project quarter, we thank you for your support and partnership. We're better when we work together and our collective efforts have made this day possible. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Andreas and Grace. Your leadership is appreciated and your successes are marked. With great pride for our region today, and for our mega region tomorrow for getting us this far to this very important milestone. I'd like to introduce our next three speakers this morning, U.S. Representative Marcy Kaptur, U.S. Representative Tim Ryan, and Myron Pakish, ODOT Turnpike Coordinator Administrator. Please welcome them. Good morning. Thank you, thank you so very much and to all the dignitaries who are here today, every one of you. Thank you for staying curious <laughs> and for inventing the future. Uh, Mr. DeLeon, thank you for traveling all the way from, did you come from Abu Dhabi? Where did you come from? Yeah, yeah. Abu Dhabi, okay, all right. Uh, most of us didn't have to travel that far, but we welcome you here to our region in uh, the winter season. 
which is something unknown in other parts of the world. I'm very honored to be here with my colleague, Congressman Tim Ryan, uh, who is one of the most inventive uh, members of Congress I have the privilege to serve with and uh, had been conducting a campaign, although that isn't the purpose of this meeting this morning, uh, for President of the United States. And think about this, Americans, was not allowed on the stage in Columbus because he didn't have enough money. And so candidates got in from California and New York who are billionaires and got in. That's wrong. That's wrong for our country. That's not the reason that we're here today, but I'll tell you what, when the money to provide additional studies uh, and research assistance for this project comes up this week when we fly back now to Washington, D.C., Tim Ryan will cast his vote in favor of research for magnetic levitation and for the advancement of systems like this one as part of the Federal Rail Administration budget. And I am honored to have him as a colleague. We work together. Uh, all the way from Youngstown through Cleveland to Toledo, way over on the west, paralleling the, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and it really is true. It really, I had to go to Canada to learn that the first electrified wind turbine uh, that was ever invented was invented by a company here, Brush Wellman, years ago. And they talk about it in Canada, but it's not talked about much here. So invention is at the heart of who we are as Ohio. And recently, we just moved a new statue into the capital of the United States. And that statue for Ohio is actually Thomas Alva Edison holding a light bulb. As I look at this project, Grace, and all of the effort that it's taken to date, I am very excited. And I hope as just one lawmaker, Tim and I serve on uh, the defense subcommittee together. We think about defense advanced research projects just next door over at Plumbrook. We are building the Orion, the lift vehicle for the space capsule that will go from Earth to Moon to eventually Mars. All right, think about that. And we have all this capability here. We have resources. All we have to do is put them together. And I hope that you will come back to me. I hold a gavel for the moment on the Energy Committee, Energy and Water, and that we will think about the research that is necessary to advance the technology, both to save energy. I think that, what is it, 0.35 kilowatt per, uh, uh, per hour that is produced or per minute that's produced in this technology, but that we will figure out how to use the assets that we have and push science. So this is the perfect place to hold this announcement here at the Great Lakes Science Center. Thank God Cleveland has it and that it is so well regarded. Val, thank you so very much for your chair role in pushing this forward. Honestly, I just think this is one of the most important projects. And all I would like to ask the CEO is if we can find a way to channel it and take it to Canada or float it on Lake Erie and link us to Ontario, Canada. If you link the O of Ontario to the O of Ohio, we could become our own country. We are so powerful economically. So let's figure out a way to do it. Thank you all for being here. Congratulations. We're glad to be partners. Thank you. Uh, it's, you know, it's not often, as, as colleagues in Washington, D.C., we get to see each other all the time. It's not often we get to be with each other back home in the home state or the home districts. And that's Marcy Kaptur every single day in Washington, D.C., on behalf of this community. And I will tell you, there's no more articulate spokesperson in Washington, really at the highest levels, chair of the Energy Appropriations uh, subcommittee that funds the Department of Energy and everything else that articulates the future like she just did, but tying it to the economic impact of working class communities that have been left behind for 30 or 40 years. And what's exciting about this project and having Marcy get five million dollars to help provide the architecture for this, uh, and I'm supporting her initiative is here because it's going to have an impact all over this region. And I'm here uh, in some ways to represent the Cleveland to Youngstown to Pittsburgh part of the corridor, <laughs> which I know is coming. Right, Mr. DeLeon? Yes. Good answer. Um, because it's going to have the impact. And if you just take half a step back, and I know Marcy has traveled a lot. I've traveled a lot. I've been to China and India. 
And I remember coming back after only being in Congress maybe five or six years, and you go to China and you see what they're doing there at such a high level with heavy, you know, I don't want to say public-private partnerships, but heavy public partnerships with some uh, private risk-taking. Um, but what you see there is mammoth investments into magnetic lev trains. I rode on one that went 280 miles an hour. This was 10 years ago. And I came back to my district, which includes Akron and Youngstown. And I just thought to myself, boy, we're not Youngstown. You know, you come from Youngstown, you're like, we got to beat Cleveland. And, or we got to get Pittsburgh or, you know, and Cleveland and Pittsburgh and all that stuff. Not football, believe me. I don't want to talk. <laughs> I do not want to talk Cleveland Browns football this morning. <laughs> yeah, it's, it hurts. It hurts. Um, but realizing that our mega region, like Val said, it's the mega region that's competing against Beijing. It's competing against Mumbai. And if we're going to stay ahead, we're not ahead in the United States just because it's happenstance. We made critical decisions over the course of many decades that got us to this position. And if we're going to maintain this position, we've got to make decisions like what we're talking about here. And to me, tying the, you know, Chicago obviously in their assets, Toledo, what they're doing in solar technology and green energy, what's happening in Cleveland and biotech and healthcare. You go down to Youngstown, cutting edge additive manufacturing and 3D printing, energy, tying it to polymers in Akron, going down to Pittsburgh and tapping into their healthcare, their biotech, their engineering, their robotics, their artificial intelligence, and putting this region on the map to compete where these workers can get back and forth in 30 minutes is an astronomical advantage for our economy here to, to blow this thing up. And, and that's what's exciting. And so I'm proud to be here with you. I say one last quick thing. Uh, I saw, I read about this a few weeks back. And it was a take on the David ver versus Goliath story. And the take I was reading in this book was that, you know, we all know David was outmatched, outexperienced. And the phrase in the Bible is that David, before he went into the fight with Goliath, thought about how he killed a bear and a lion with his bare hands. And the point was, he remembered his victories before he went in to the big match. He remembered his victories. And so as we sit here today, any victory we've had in Northeast Ohio has been when we work together. There's not one major project that's happened in this community or my community or anywhere around where we didn't work together. And so we need to remember that it's going to be Mr. De Leon. It's going to be the Democrats in Congress. It's going to be the Republican in the governor's office. It's going to be Dave Wondolowski in the Cuyahoga County building and construction trades. It's going to be the local inventors and entrepreneurs, local civic leaders, and Armin and the mayor and his team. Togetherness, that's how you get this stuff done. Remember our victories. And our victories came from togetherness, from working together. Marcy and I and our delegation is committed to this project. We want to see it through because it will give our kids and our grandkids opportunities that other generations never had. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. On behalf of ODOT Director Jack Marchbanks, thank you for having me here today. The history of transportation in the United States is woven throughout the story of our state, from buggy manufacturing to aviation innovation to automotive and automotive parts manufacturing. Ohioans have always been leaders in developing and supporting new innovative ways to get around. Director Marchbanks recently traveled the state telling our ODOT employees that we are, are on the precipice of a transportation paradigm shift unlike anything we've, we've seen since the innovation of the automobile. As the state agency responsible for building and maintaining our road 
and Bridge Network, Governor Mike DeWine and Lieutenant Governor John Husted have asked us to keep a finger on the pulse of these advancements and make strategic investments where they make sense. Our Drive Ohio team is closely watching the rapid development of technologies like autonomous vehicles, vehicle to vehicle or infrastructure communication and vehicle electrification. Hyperloop is another example of a fast evolving technology we are all watching closely that could revolutionize the way we move people and goods throughout the state and the country. We were happy to support this feasibility study and look forward to reviewing the details released today. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Representatives Kaptur, Ryan, and Mr. Pakish for your service and for your inspiration. We will now have remarks from consortium member Carlos Grudzinski, who is chairman of the Ohio Aerospace and Aviation Technology Committee. Thank you very much. I'll just say a few words on behalf of the Aviation and Aerospace Technology Committee, which I'm a member of and I'm the chairman of the Aerospace Council. Um, I want to give you a couple of statistics and let you know why I'm here to, to introduce uh, Chuck Michael in, in a bit. But um, the closest as far as the technology that makes a Hyperloop capable is uh, the aerospace technology in the industry. Um, the passive levitation has come out of uh, the aerospace sector, and I represent basically the aerospace industry within, within Ohio, and we've been organizing ourselves for, for quite a while and been part of the, the Great Lakes Hyperloop Consortium, as well as, as this study, which I'm very excited about. I also represent a local engineering firm that does a lot of spaceflight hardware, and as someone said, we've been in the aerospace and aviation sector here in Ohio for, for quite a while. There's a NASA center here, the headquarters of uh, the Air Force is in Dayton, and it's also home of Air, Air Force Research Laboratory. Um, so if uh, people have talked about the, the metropolis or this mega, mega area, the Great Lakes um, region, is actually, if you looked at it from, uh, from an economic standpoint, it would be like in the top five economies of the world. Um, and the one sector that's really uh, leading and, and, and still ahead in, in this country, certainly um, from an innovation and a making perspective, is the aerospace sector. We have a, um, uh, a huge amount of exports, and if you include Canada and Quebec as well, not just Ontario, um, it's, it's, it's it, it's second to none. Uh, with that, um, we look to, to make this happen. It's really the local supply base and supply chain, and we're all about making here, and we're excited to do that and to make this happen. So uh, to not belabor the point and to in introduce uh, Michael, um, or Chuck Michael, sorry, uh, which is why we're all here. Um, Chuck has, has led this study, and uh, we're excited to, to hear the details. Um, and I'm excited to get this thing going. So thank you very much. Good morning and thank you all for coming today. I have the privilege of describing just how phenomenal this technology is. So we're going to go through this, through this very quickly. But um, so fasten your seat belts because it's going to be quite a ride. The, the Hyperloop system is, is um, uh, housed inside of a reduced pressure tube. And there's a capsule inside that is a, similar to an airplane fuselage without engines or uh, wings. So the, the, um, the capsule is supported and levitated with a passive magnetic levitation system. And what that is is a, uh, a series of magnets in a, in a specific array that takes no energy at all to levitate. Remember when you're kids and you're playing with the magnets? And that's exactly what we've done here. They're a little bit larger and a little bit more powerful, but they will levitate this machine with no energy input. Now you're inside a reduced pressure tube and you're off the, 
the guideway that we call it that it sits on. So there's no aerodynamic drag in there because we have no air. The, the magnetic drag that you get from the magnets actually reduces the faster you go. So now we've designed a machine that the faster you go, the more efficient it becomes, which is a little counterintuitive, but I'll show you how that works. Everything is enclosed so that we, uh, we don't have any at-grade crossings. Uh, we don't meet any traffic anywhere. And on the top, we took the opportunity to, to install uh, solar panels on top so that the system becomes energy self-sufficient. Technology. There we go. Um, you've heard about the, the um, public-private partnership that we formed with NOACA. And um, this is the, the structure of, the, of the, uh, the P3, as we call it. This is a very important part in how this project got started. Uh, NOACA issued a re request for proposal for consultants. They selected Thames, who is a consultant out of Frederick, Maryland, with a long history in transport economics which was a big key for us, as well as the, the, the technical side in determining the alignment. Uh, from there, we initiated the feasibility study with a scope of work, and we started, um, we issued the, the P3, was started in, in February of 2018, and we began the study in July of 2018, and we finished last night. <clears throat> so there you go. <laughs> the, other, the other key, part here, and you've heard it described a number of times, and that's the local involvement. The, uh, the consortium, the Great Lakes Hyperloop Consortium, includes over 80 entities that, that we've, we've mentioned, but it could not have been done without that. If you look at the, the, the number of entities here, uh, it is incredible. On the top is the, is the federal government, and the United States Department of Transportation organized a special council of all the administrations inside of the DOT, and they call it the NET Council. It stands for uh, Non-Traditional and Emerging Transportation Technologies, recognizing that a technology like Hyperloop doesn't fit in any of the existing administrations. It's a little bit highway, it's a little bit railroad, it's a little bit aerospace, uh, and so the, the uh, USDOT organized this net council. What that means to the project is when we go to DC and we sit down in a meeting, uh, we have representatives from every conceivable uh, unit inside of DOT that will have a, a role in this project. So now we don't have to go to 15 different meetings. We can just have one single meeting in DC, which I'm sure many of you would appreciate. We also have three technical advisory committees, and these were very critical. Uh, one in Pittsburgh, one in Cleveland, and one in Chicago. Uh, each of these areas have their own specific needs, and uh, uh, both from transportation and from how we site stations. Uh, and so that's a very important part. It brings, it brings all of those areas into the, the project, and this is all the DOTs, the turnpike authorities, the the MPOs, Metropolitan Planning Organizations, and others in each of these communities that were invaluable. The feasibility study itself had all of these pieces that we had to answer, uh, and they're all complete. Um, the, the route study between Chicago, Pittsburgh, and, and Cleveland, ridership and revenue, again, very important. Independent capital cost estimate. Uh, this is something that we had a third party uh, prepare the cost estimate for us. Uh, operating co because it's never been done before, so that's a very challenging thing. Operating cost estimate, revenue projections and forecasts, cost benefit analysis. Those of you in the transportation business understand that there's this magical mathematical system that the federal government uses called a cost benefit analysis. So I'll describe that to you. Uh, it'll only take a few hours, but it's okay. Uh, supply side economics. Um, this is this is where the jobs begin to to show up, and the um, the transportation oriented development TOD, which is going to occur around the stations in all of the locations, and that has a real impact and and, and positive benefits to the communities. This is the route that um, we're working with, beginning in Chicago, through South Bend, Toledo, uh, Cleveland Airport, Cleveland. Youngstown, uh, Pittsburgh Airport, and uh, downtown Pittsburgh. 
there's three routes there. The orange one is uh, what we call a straight line route, and that's the fastest possible way to get from here to Chicago. Uh, it gets a little wet on the way. We go underwater. Uh, we don't go in the water, but we go underneath the lake bed. Uh, and that's around a 30-minute uh, journey, although it gets very expensive, and we, we, we priced it out because we're very curious. The blue line is what we call the turnpike route or the toll road route, and that uses existing highway rights of way. Um, all through Ohio is Ohio DOT and the turnpike uh, right of way. We get into Indiana, the same thing, and into Chicago, so you can see how important it is to have the DOTs involved at the front end of this to help us map out this pathway. When we get to uh, western Pennsylvania, uh, things change a little bit because the topography there wasn't as kind as it is in uh, Ohio and Indiana. So we had to look at a number of different routes. Uh, we'll have some areas that are above grade and, and elevated, and we'll have some configurations that are underground in tunnels. Uh, that We have developed some interesting ways of, of building underground where it's cheaper to build underground and minimize the impacts than uh, it's less expensive there than an elevated system, especially in an urban environment. This, here's, here's an interesting thing. The, the, the transformative nature of this entire system uh, is it, it energizes a transport revolution like we've never seen in our lifetime. I don't think anyone in this room was here when the Wright brothers took off, and that was the last time that there was really any introduction of a new mode of transportation. It's over 100 years ago. So now this is a history setting moment here, uh, and we're extremely excited to be here. Now, in the, um, in, inside, in the, in the passenger capsule, if you go from Cleveland to Chicago, this is a speed profile, and this shows the, the acceleration where it goes up, and then you slow down and you speed up, and we do that when we come to corners and so forth, uh, and we'll begin to optimize that. But this is a 330-mile journey from here to Chicago, you have an average speed of 439 miles per hour, and you have a top speed of 700 miles an hour. That's faster than an airplane. We're on the ground, and we're much safer than an aircraft. And they are very safe these days. So from Cleveland to Pittsburgh, now you have a 143-mile journey. You have an average speed, if you're really in a hurry to get to Pittsburgh, an average speed of 339 miles an hour and a top speed of 525 miles an hour. Think about that in the wintertime, and there's no icy roads and anything like that to, to slow you down. This is an energy comparison. This, is, this also is, uh, is a, a benchmark, if you will. This compares the efficiency uh, and the uh, energy consumption of various modes of transportation. You see a high-speed rail is very efficient, but it, it really doesn't go that fast. Even even with the name of high-speed rail, it's really not that fast, in our world anyway. A car is um, uh, much less efficient, and the faster you go, that little line beside it, the faster you go, the more energy you use. An aircraft is very fast, but it's not really that efficient, uh, and the faster you go, the more fuel you use. And when you come to Hyperloop, the faster you go, the more efficient it becomes. And that orange line along the top is the energy we generate ourselves to power the system. And we become, we're, we're energy uh, net positive, And we're able to sustain the, the operations and the, the energy demand of the system without relying on existing power supplies and infrastructure. Yay. Now, here's another one. This is, this is emissions. And this is an easy answer for us, but if you look at a car and an air, aircraft and a rail, and they all have CO2 emissions, uh, we don't have any. So now, if you, you're, you're displacing existing forms of transportation, whether it's automobile or rail or whatever the case may be, and you're moving to Hyperloop, so over the course of 25 years, we've reduced the e emission of CO2 by 143 million tons just in this region alone. That's incredible. No one else can do that. As we get into the financials, and this is, this is the fun part, for some of us anyway, uh, there's, there's ridership and there's revenue and so forth that, that we look at. And 
Uh, as we add stations, you tend to add riders, which is reasonable. But you also have this compounding effect, and there's a synergy as you add an additional uh, community, like um, when we added <coughs> South Bend, Indiana, as an example. We had a big growth in ridership, not because people are going from South Bend to to um, you know Chicago back and forth like that, but mostly there's there's an uh, access from South Bend into Toledo, access into Cleveland, access from Pittsburgh back to South Bend if you want to do that. So as you look at the, the synergies in where these stations are placed in a strategic sense, you can design a system that is extremely effective financially. I'll show you how. There's a diversion of, of riders from automobile or plane or rail or whatever they're doing now. There's a diversion because the Hyperloop is faster, cheaper, and uh, safer. There's also an induced ridership. These are people that may travel from Cleveland to Chicago on a daily basis that don't do that now. I wonder who, I don't know who commutes daily, but now you can do that if that's what you want to do. You can go every three days or you can go on a weekend. You can, you can park your car in, in um, Cleveland and go to a ball game in Chicago and probably save money, enough money from parking to buy the ticket to go back and forth. A lot of market influences here. Now, <clears throat> this is a fun one too. Uh, and uh, Pardon me if all this math stuff is fun, but this is what makes the, the system work, is understanding the economics of it. This is the cost of freight transport. So if you look at the, at the left side, this is air cargo. Air cargo costs about $4.63 a ton mile. So not everything travels by air cargo because it needs to be valuable in order to justify that high cost. Uh, our freight system focuses and, and targets the high value, time sensitive um, freight and cargo that needs to get from point A to point B as fast as possible. So if you look at our cost, 10 cents a ton mile. We're less expensive than trucking, except for like in town, because we don't do that too well at 700 miles an hour. But um, the, the value of, of shipping by Hyperloop is much more efficient and cost effective by truck or than it is by truck, and certainly much more than by uh, air freight. We're competitive with water, which is like barges and ships and so forth. But if you have high value, time sensitive shipments, you usually don't ship them by boat. So that's, that market's there, but probably won't be tapped that much. And rail, that's more of a commodity, bulk commodity type of a, of a system where we're never going to haul coal or oil or grain or anything like that. But we will haul the time-sensitive, uh, high-value, high-margin freight and save the shippers money. We can do it certainly less than $4.63. So we get into the property value. Every time you build a large project, it doesn't matter what it is, there's going to be an improvement in the properties in the communities that you build it in. When you build a transportation system, there is a, there is a demand for development around the transit system. You look at any, any successful light rail system, high-speed rail system, you'll see a real growth in what we call transportation-oriented development. Uh, we've, we've listed out here estimates that, uh, that, that the economists have modeled in terms of the, of the value of increased development around various stations from Chicago, Toledo, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, $74 billion in development. That's what it means to the communities and to Ohio and the region up here is tremendous economic development. In terms of jobs, when, when you spend billions of dollars, you create lots of economic opportunity for uh, tens of thousands, in this case, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, job estimates over 25 years, over 900,000 jobs just in this region. <clears throat> income increase, and that's not individual increase, 
of 47 billion, but it's 47 billion spread out across the region, which is still significant. Uh, property value increase, again, this is the $74 billion number. Um, the taxes, every time you, you increase the, 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 uh, the incomes and you increase the value of the properties and you introduce new properties, you generate new taxes. So you have local taxes, federal income taxes, at 9.4 billion, they're going to take their share. And property tax is about a billion two, so a total of over $12 billion in taxes over the course of 25 years. That's not every year, but it's over the course of 25 years. <clears throat> it's still gonna bite, but that's okay, because you get, you get some benefit from that. Now we get into um, why this is such a good deal. Uh, this is the, this is the uh, infamous benefit cost discussion, but you add up all of the, of the benefits, and you add up all the costs, and you relate those to each other, and you can come up with a, a, a ratio. Uh, if your costs exceed your, your benefits, then you probably aren't going to build anything. No one's going to finance it for you. Uh, if your benefits exceed your cost, then you have a fairly good project, and then it be becomes how good of a project is it? From a federal perspective, you have to have your, your um, benefit cost ratio, which is the, the, the total benefits to the cost of, of, of 1.0, which means they're equal. A really good project would have a benefit cost ratio of about 1.2, 1.3, a superstar project maybe 1.5, and here we come in in a very conservative level of a 2.2. That tells the federal government this is a good investment. That tells the private sector this is a good investment. As you move from that into uh, what we call an operating ratio, which is okay if it's good, how, how good is it? Then you relate your uh, revenue to your total costs. If, if your costs exceed your revenue, you're gonna be out of business probably by the end of the week. If, you're, if, they're, if they're equal, you're not making any money at all, you're just trading dollars with somebody else. Uh, if you're up into the 1.5, then your, your revenues are 50% more than your costs. In our particular case, our, our operating ratio is four something. Um, it is incredible. It doesn't matter if it's 4.1 or 4.2, depending on which way you look at it, but a, an operating ratio of four tells the financial community that it supports and, and, and validates the benefit cost ratio. So all of this means that it's a financeable uh, system that requires no subsidies, local, state, federal, at all, and that it can be, it, it can support its entire capital cost by itself. Think about that. Grace is here and we thank her for everything she's done on this project and she understands the economics of this. She's a numbers person, she gets that. And, um, as, as, he, as, as Grace says, it exceeds the federal standards. It exceeds really their expectations for a project like this. So um, we appreciate that. Um, Dr. Alex Metcalf, you'll see him a little bit later. He's an economist. He's the consultant for uh, NUACA. And uh, he's going to talk a little bit on the, on the panel anyway about the economics of this. But he's been doing this for a very long time and he's never in, 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 his, in his entire career, seen a project that performs like this. And the reason it performs like this is we're, we're, we're changing the norm. We're, we're changing the paradigm. Uh, this is not a railroad. This is not a, uh, a, a bus. This is, is not anything that exists today. And if we're able to design and build a system that, that we can levitate it and move it with no energy input on the levitation. We do use some electricity to shoot it down the track, but we get that from our own generation. So if you can build a self-sufficient system that's extraordinarily fast with a low operating cost, then you have something that is new and, and profitable and worthy of the next step. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. That was informative.
I loved the math um, and, and very exciting results. So let's discuss those results in a little more detail. Um, to dive into that and hear a little more on the Great Lakes Hyperloop Feasibility Study, we will be hearing from Dirk Album, Chairman and Founder of HTT, Grace Gallucci of NOACA, and Dr. Alexander Metcalf of Thames Consulting as part of our panel. Our panel moderator is astronaut Doug Wheelock from NASA Glenn Research Center. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed panel as they come to the stage. Ah, it's great to be here. My name, my name is Doug Wheelock, and on behalf of the NASA Administrator and our uh, administration and headquarters out here at NASA Glenn Research Center, uh, welcome. We're, we're, it takes, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. I'm not originally from Ohio, but I got here as quickly as I could. And um, I grew up in upstate New York in a very small town uh, on the west side of the Catskills. And, um, just an ordinary kid from an ordinary place. And um, I watched people walk on the moon when I was a little boy. And I thought, like, those things seem so distant for me. Uh, that's not something that I can play a part in. Uh, years later, um, I was selected as an astronaut in August of 1998. Three days later, we had the astronaut reunion. And the old pioneers came back. and dinner that Friday night, I sat on the table with Neil Armstrong. And my knees were shaking, and they're shaking now, actually, uh, because I, I, I thought to myself, how did I end up here, you know? And I, I remembered how it, and it came my time to ask him a question. Um, and I, 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 all the, the only thing I could remember is growing up as a little kid and watching him walk on the moon and I wanted to know how he felt, because I remember how I felt as an ordinary kid. And that night, he said something that changed my life. And um, he said, you know, I, I asked him, I said, Mr. Armstrong, when you were standing on the moon, did you have a moment where you can actually, you know, deep breath and reflect on what a profound moment it was in human history? And he said, I did. I thought about my, the engineers that built that rocket. I thought about my teachers. And I thought to myself, how does an ordinary kid from Wapakoneta, Ohio, end up standing on the moon. And we all kind of laughed nervously, and I thought to myself, hey, wait a second, that's my story. You know? And the reality is, this is a story for all of us. Um, we're all just ordinary kids from ordinary places, and then we have some people that step out with a dream, and their life intersects with the extraordinary. And that's what we do at NASA. We, we ignite dreams, we change lives, and we get out of people's way when they have these innovative ideas. Because we know the power of an innovative idea in any branch of technology or science will one day become revolutionary, maybe in a completely different area of science and technology. But we're, all, we're in the business at NASA at uh, nurturing these, uh, these innovative ideas. So it's a pleasure for me to be here with you. Um, so grateful to be here in Ohio, uh, working at NASA Glenn Research Center. And I'm, I, like I said, I'm from upstate New York. My wife is from Akron and grew up in Doylestown, if you know where that is. And um, in the fall, we were standing at Huntington Park up on the lake, and, and it was, it was, the leaves were beautiful. And she looked at me, she goes, I hope you still like it here in the winter. And I said, I'm from upstate New York. It's like, you guys don't have anything on us. But. It's a real pleasure to be here and our distinguished uh, panel members, and I have some questions. I think we'll get right into the questions, and then we'll, afterward we'll open it up to Q&A as well. Um, first question is for Grace. Um, Grace, we've been told that the economic benefits along the corridor are unprecedented. What does this really mean in practical terms for the folks that are living here? So the results demonstrate that the Hyperloop can be funded privately. Um, that is really uh, the first time in ground transportation that that's the case. So you're looking at something 
um, in the form of transportation that will be available to all and does not need a tax subsidy. And I think that really creates a different vision uh, for us. Uh, relative to the development, there isn't any uh, funding that's required from any source other than the private sector. So thank you, Grace. The next question is for Alex. Alex, uh, the Hyperloop is expected to offer travel at high speeds. What will a ticket cost for that kind of time savings? Um, in terms of the uh, cost of uh, tickets, uh, essentially, uh, what we're looking at is uh, very, very uh, cost-effective fares. We expect fares to be in the range of about two-thirds Amtrak fares, which everybody in the room who's traveled on Amtrak knows are pretty competitive with air. And essentially what we expect is that uh, we'll be offering the most cost-effective way of being able to travel in the, in the corridor between the three cities. Very good. Thank you, Alex. Question for Dirk. What will it be like to ride a Hyperloop in terms of comfort and safety? So <clears throat> at the end, the Hyperloop is going to be very similar to what you already know. It's um, similar to an airplane, similar to a train. In fact, when we did the study, we used acceleration rates that are very similar to what you know today in the train market. So you're able to get up, you're able to, um, to walk around. It's uh, not the roller coaster rides that a lot of people are imagining. It needs to be something that um, appeals to a 60, 70 year old as much as to a two year old. So it needs to be a system that works for everybody. Absolutely. Thank you, Dirk. For Chuck, what's the significance of the Great Lakes Hyperloop Consortium? Our consortium has over 80 members, and these are universities, they're cities, counties, MPOs, DOTs, turnpike authorities. Um, and as, as I said earlier, it gives us the ability to, to learn about each community from their own voices. Uh, these are things that we can't find out on our own in a short period of time. So we look to them to provide advice. We look to the universities uh, and academic centers for uh, local knowledge is an example of uh, the, the regional geology in Ohio. Um, that's something that we can, we can use locally. The aerospace industry here is, uh, is, is endless in terms of resources for us, and we have so much in common with them that this is a great place for us to, uh, to continue to work, especially with the aerospace side. Very good. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, back to Alex. Alex? Are you expecting Hyperloop to cost less to build than high-speed rail? Um, yes, indeed, we are. Uh, the great advantage of Hyperloop is that, effectively, it uses a four-meter tunnel. And the four-meter tunnel, uh, as compared to a six- or eight-meter tunnel that you would need for a high-speed rail. So whereas the typical prices for high-speed rail would run probably in the order of, uh, you know, something like um, 100 million a mile, we're probably going to be in the order of 50 million a mile. Very good. And I think you uh, answered Chuck's question. I had a question about the cost to, uh, per mile to build. And maybe, uh, Chuck, you could uh, cover the differences between the, the water route, the direct route, and underground and above ground as well, of course. Sure. The, uh, uh, the options we have in terms of construction, there's, there's several. You can be above ground and elevated. You can be underground. But that depends on the location that you're going through. So let's say we're in an urban area like downtown Cleveland. Uh, it's, it would be very difficult for us to get to the center of the city in an elevated sense because we would have to go around buildings and so forth. And, and that's just very expensive. And it also is, it, 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 uh, it, there's a lot of impacts in an urban setting for that. So we have an underground uh, approach. So we approach in, in downtown Cleveland uh, through a deep tunnel. And that's what Dr. Metcalf is talking about. Our tunnels are, are very cost effective. And in that sense, it's going to be less expensive 
to build a tunnel than it is to try to weave a, an elevated system through a downtown urban area. Uh, if we're out in the rural areas, we have a number of challenges there because uh, we respect the, 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 the landowners and the rural uh, setting so that we have to be very careful that we don't uh, adversely impact their livelihood uh, so, so that it may be a shallow tunnel out there. If we're inside of a existing right-of-way for, uh, say, the turnpike, we could use an elevated section there or we could go in a shallow section next to the highway. Uh, the ranges of costs would be um, probably a, a little bit less than 50 million a mile for the, the shallow tunnel, uh, upwards to 60-some uh, million a mile for the, the more complex, um, like Western Pennsylvania terrain, uh, in terms of navigating that, that terrain with an underground system. So a, a big range there. So in the, in the next phase of the, of the work, we'll try to fine tune how many miles of each of those that we have to do, but um, that's about it. Awesome. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, back over to Grace. Uh, Grace, could you elaborate a little bit on the right of way issue? So one of the reasons uh, we thought when we approached uh, the concept of the Cleveland to Chicago and then ultimately uh, Cleveland to Chicago and Pittsburgh corridor um, is that it would be very attractive as a pilot uh, for Hyperloop because the right-of-way um, along that corridor is already owned by government. So there's already a turnpike or a toll road um, along the entire corridor and that would suggest, um, as most planners would like to see, that any kind of land acquisition uh, doesn't need to take place. Um, and doesn't need to be uh, disturbing the environment. So we're really looking at using um, existing right-of-way. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, back to Chuck. Uh, Chuck, uh, have you given thought, this question, that you've given thought to using wind energy or hydroelectric energy along this corridor? I heard you mention uh, there'll be solar uh, panels and things on the top that's above ground, but things that are underground do we intend or is there a capability to use cleaner systems as well for those areas? We have a variety of renewable energy resources that we can use. Uh, if we're an elevated system, then we use the solar panels on top of the tubes. If we're underground, then we don't have any solar panels there or they wouldn't be very effective. So we can use an, another source like wind energy. Uh, we can use hydroelectric energy. Uh, so a variety of renewable resource uh, for, for energy sources are available to us. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, back to Alex. Uh, we talk a lot about passenger travel, but how will Hyperloop benefit freight along this corridor? Uh, freight is a very important commodity for Hyperloop. Basically, uh, one of the big growth industries in America at the moment is the less than truckload traffic and also the parcel markets. We all see the way in which we use uh, UPS, FedEx, and Amazon to uh, move parcels around for us and get our stuff increasingly using that and a really strong growth industry. As a result, the, there is a significant impact of the, that kind of freight uh, on the interstate system and a very large proportion of the trucks and particularly the truck trains moving on the interstate are in fact for uh, parcel traffic. That parcel traffic will grow probably in the order of 12-15% in the next 20 years and what Hyperloop provides is the ability to move that growth in parcel traffic which really is driving the new economy and creating all the new jobs that we heard about in terms of health, energy, uh, logistics, uh, software, uh, and high-tech industry. That Hyperloop provides the ability to move all that freight in the future. So whereas we have a capacity problems or beginning to have capacity problems with the movement of that freight on the interstate system, Hyperloop will offer the ability to basically divert that onto Hyperloop 
and therefore give us the ability to uh, uh, accommodate the needs of the new economy as it grows in the next 20 years. Thank you, Alex. And uh, staying on that with you, Alex, uh, the, the business model, is this a self-sustaining business case? In other words, will it really pay for itself? This is really the remarkable finding and the big takeaway, I think, from this study is that for the last 30 years, we've been studying various forms of high-speed rail and various forms of transportation that we hope will provide better economics and better financing. The big takeaway from this study is that, in fact, it is a self-sustaining investment. The IRR, the internal rate of return on the project, is 6%. And if the private sector wanted to, it could actually uh, provide it financing to actually build and operate the system without any assistance from government. We think that a public-private partnership is the way to go. We think that, for example, the federal government probably would want to be involved in uh, uh, such a huge project as this. But if necessary, the private sector on its own, without help from the federal state governments could in effect build and sustain the system over a 20-year period, uh, you know, which is the life of the project, uh, quite comfortably. With typical investment coming from uh, things like teachers' pension funds, uh, trade union funds, uh, from uh, 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 the investment banks, the hedge funds, all would be interested in the kind of rate of return that we're basically generating in the project. Great. Thank you, Alex. Uh, back over here to Grace. Uh, Grace, will the taxpayers need to subsidize the cost of operating this Hyperloop system? Um, you know, as I mentioned early, the, the idea is that they would not have to do that. Uh, the private sector um, would be able to generate enough revenue through the uh, development operations and maintenance of the system uh, to be self-sufficient. Awesome. Thank you, Grace. Dirk, to you, finally. Sorry, I skipped over you a couple times there. Um, the benefit, what is the benefit to the investor in this system? Well, <clears throat> I think that it kind of was already said, right? So the biggest impact here is that the system actually is able to generate an income. And when we looked into this technology and the viability of this new technology six years ago, we saw that uh, technology wasn't really the issue. The big problem to solve was that there's no rail line, no metro line in the whole world that's profitable. So the Hyperloop can be profitable, as we have shown and as we are releasing here today. And um, of course, it allows for investors to invest into a stable company on the long term. So as Alex mentioned, pension funds, for example, are very interested in this. But if you're an investor and you want to invest for a longer period of time and want to have a stable return of investment, it's the right investment for you. But I think the most important thing is also to think about what that really does to infrastructure and what that does to a country like the US, the opportunity that you have, because the reason why we don't have uh, more infrastructure in the world, more trains in the world, is that it's not only about building them, because all, everybody always talks about how much money does it really cost to build them. Mm -hmm. But the real issue is to maintain them. And uh, here in this case, it pays back the initial investment, so it doesn't really matter how much it's going to cost. It comes back and it pays for itself. And that's a big difference. Awesome. Thank you, Dirk. Uh, back over to Grace. Uh, with what Dirk had just mentioned about the uh, return on investment, um, if there are anticipated public funding of different in the future, uh, where do you see public funding applied to the system? So the component of the project that we have been interested as the private sector is in the public policy. So clearly we are interested in the routes, the, um, the alignment, the right of ways, uh, the station locations, uh, the fare structure. Um, and, and to that point, I do want to mention with the fare structure, uh, despite the fact that the Hyperloop um, uh, is profitable, 
Um, it isn't profitable because it's it, it's um, only charging fares that are uh, what 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 some might consider elite fares. Uh, this is expected to have fares that are affordable and accessible to all people, particularly if we are looking at Hyperloop to uh, provide additional opportunities for people to live and work in different places and to access access. Uh, those jobs, they would need to have a fare that is more like a commuter rail kind of fare that they could uh, they could afford. Uh, so I um, wanted to make sure I got that in there. Um, and then I'm sorry, the question again? Well, actually, the um, that leads me to the last question, which is for both you and Dirk, and you can you can. You were saying, about, where does government need what, to provide additional? Right. So, um, so, so thinking about that, we certainly need to be engaged in additional study. Um, as government, we want to make sure that the public policy um, ideals are maintained and that we are looking for this to be a form of transportation for everybody. Um, so I, can, I, I see us, NOACA, as well as the other um, MPOs um, and the state, the Turnpike folks, uh, being engaged um, throughout the study process. Um, I see some um, engagement in the um, early parts of the construction. Um, in terms of funding, again, as Dirk said, the major funding for the building operating and maintaining is part of the analysis that would be paid for by the private sector and then recouped as part of a normal business venture. Um, so really we're, we're looking at uh, being engaged as a public uh, part of the public-private partnership to ensure that um, it's moving forward as a public asset. Thank you, Grace. And uh, last, for both Dirk and Grace, you can handle these as you'd like. Um, what happens now and what happens next for this, this system? You want to say? Well, <laughs> I, um, I, I can say again, uh, NOACA, um, along with our partners uh, locally, have demonstrated that we are very interested in being a leader in this new form of technology. Um, but this is a private sector driven initiative. And so we look towards continuing to partner, but taking our lead from the private sector as to where they would want to uh, go with this in terms of uh, the next steps. So we need to build it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's basically the next steps. Of course, there is a lot of uh, smaller steps that come before that. Um, the environmental impact study, for example, is one. Uh, in general, as, um, as a company, I mean, we are now in the process of integrating the complete system in Toulouse uh, after having done all the testing. And um, the big hurdle to overcome is regulation, right? A regulatory framework. So being here and having the stakeholders together with us ensures us that we are able to build the system. And um, I believe that funding especially now that we have the report and everything done, is not going to be the issue. But we need, of course, the public side to help us to bring a completely new mode of transportation to the US. And um, we're very happy to be here in Cleveland and have Cleveland being part of the, being the first ones to make this happen. You know, we have been working um, at the federal level as well, and as uh, both uh, representatives uh, Captor and Ryan uh, mentioned, there's opportunities um, at the federal level to partner uh, with them to advance the technology, uh, particularly relative to this corridor. Uh, so uh, there are other um, opportunities um, to have the federal government, the local government, and uh, state government partner to facilitate this. Very good. Thank you for mentioning that. They, having uh, U.S. Representative Kapter and Ryan here uh, this morning were a wonderful uh, connection and collaboration with the federal government, and as well as Dr. McCall. Thank you for being here from the mayor's office as well. Um, the, I did get a concerning question that we, we're at, we are at the Great Lakes Science Center, which happens to double as the visitor center for NASA Glenn Research Center as well. And the electrical 
props that you see on the stage are not energized, for those that were concerned. <laughs> Although Tesla and Edison would be proud, uh, for our panel members, uh, peace of mind, they're not energized. So um, I think with that, we... Uh, <laughs> let's see a sigh of relief. Um, I think we have time to open it up for Q&A from the audience here as well. So I think, do we have microphones to come along? Or? Okay, here we go. You raise your hand and the microphone will come to you. Thank you. Hi, I'm, is this on? Yes. Uh, Steve Litt from the Plain Dealer. Uh, greetings to our visitors and hi, Grace. Hello. Uh, what are the next steps that uh, NOACA and HTT will take uh, in, in terms of forming a public-private partnership to uh, uh, develop, build, and operate Hyperloop? So the next steps, as Dirk had mentioned, um, from a practical perspective, we are looking at an environmental impact study um, and preliminary engineering along with some additional economic um, analysis relative to the benefits associated with manufacturing uh, the Hyperloop. Um, to that end, uh, we are looking for uh, some funding uh, jointly um, and uh, we have applied for uh, the magnetic levitation uh, grant that um, I believe uh, one of the representatives, Marcy Kaptur, had mentioned. And what, what is the amount of that grant? It's $5 million of a total uh, program, but some of that is uh, public funding, some of it is private funding. And the status of that application? Uh, we just submitted the application in um, about 10 days, two weeks ago. And which administration would that come from? Um, it would come from USDOT. Uh, any timetable, uh, uh, Mr. Alborn, in terms of when you would like to see uh, all of this happen? <laughs> well, liking to see is would be tomorrow, maybe even today, but realistically, there's just a lot of bureaucracy, right? So you're, you're, it's, it's kind of not, unfortunately, not in our hands, but uh, I think that events like these, and of course, uh, even the publicity that comes with it and the media support will help us to find other partners, to help us to gather more partners. And as you have seen, we have over 80 stakeholders here locally, and um, that, that really helps to move the project forward. I also want to mention that there is some funding uh, that has passed through the House Appropriations Committee um, as also mentioned earlier, uh, to facilitate and assist in developing overall national uh, standards and policies around Hyperloop. And although that has not uh, completely uh, passed uh, yet through uh, the Senate, and uh, it, we would be looking to uh, work with the Net Council then to um, be one of their pilots for that funding. But I, I, I also believe that inside the study there is a timeline, right? There is. So the, so the study states that essentially we are looking at uh, three to four years for the EIS, which is the Environmental Impact Study, um, and the Preliminary Engineering. Um, and then after that, again, we're assuming that if everything moves forward very smoothly, they've got a six-year construction period. Uh, so that would take us to 2028 or 2029, I believe, to be operational. And that's assuming everything works as, uh, as it would be planned. When are you starting to work on the EIS? Well, we have not set a specific timeline for doing that. We're waiting for uh, the, uh, the results of the, uh, the grant application, the competition. Dan DeRose with Channel 19. Um, people are going to want some hard numbers on this. Uh, you talked about 50 to $60 million a mile. Obviously, the route, you've got three different routes there. Somewhere on paper, you guys have an estimate. If it's $50 million a mile, what's the total project cost? If it's $60 million a mile, somewhere you guys have an, an estimate. What is that? In, in each of the, the zones that we've, <clears throat> we've looked at, they have so many miles of tunnels, so many miles of elevated, so many miles of the other. So we've already included that in the cost estimate and applied the unit cost for each mile of each segment. Uh, the, the other thing that we've done is 
none of us have ever built this before. And uh, we, we relied on the, on the private sector to help us with the cost estimates. And when we got all those estimates in, we added another 30% contingency just because we don't know. But I think that's a safe number because we're, we're starting with a lot of, of confidence from the contractors that they can build a tunnel, that they can build a pylon for this much money. But again, things change. And so the 30%, I think, is a wise thing. On top of the 30%, we put another 28% for additional costs like uh, engineering, legal, administrative, things like that. So um, I, I think it's a fairly comprehensive budget. And we've broken it down as much as we can at this level. The environmental process will help us define uh, more closely the areas that are underground, the areas that are above ground, and then we can begin to get a, a, a little bit better cost estimate. And, so and you don't have a hard number. At the high end, it's going to be X amount of millions or billions of dollars, and at the low end, it's going to be X amount. Uh, on an average, it's around 55, I believe. Um, total to, total cost. Yeah, I so said to be clear, I, the, the reason we are looking at ranges is because we still have open three different routes. This is a feasibility study, so we have not selected which route we would take. And there's various options, and depending on the geographic terrain in particular, a mile would cost different in this location versus that location based on some of those, those aspects. A total cost um, of the project, um, I believe, Alex, you know that off the top of your head, uh, about right? About $25 billion. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, Louis from the Toledo team. These guys here. Uh, so I actually have a question regarding the design of the HTT pods. I know that you guys mentioned that you'll be using a magnetic configuration commonly referred to as a held back array. Um, my question is, would you be using linear or rotational motion to actually generate the lift? And if you're using rotational motion, do you guys have contingencies in place to deal with any of the hitting issues that may come with it? Yeah, so it's a passive magnetic levitation technology that was developed by Lawrence Livermore Labs. And um, regarding the, uh, the propulsion system, it's uh, a linear motor. So, um, yeah, I hope, <laughs> yeah, no, you know. That. But I'm happy to have you come and uh, maybe to our LA office and we give you a little bit more detail too. Okay. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Nick Castell from IdeaStream. I had a question about the, uh, the, in the back here, the technical and the testing side of things here. In, in the testing that you've done so far on the actual technology, how far has it traveled, how fast has it gone, and have you put a person inside yet? So the way that you build or test these technologies is that you're, you know, you have to do component tests, basically. So these technologies are all coming from existing modes of transportation, if you want so. So um, obviously we're able to build tubes, we're able to build pylons, we're able to create a vacuum inside tubes. Our partners have done, uh, have done these, we have done several tests. Now we're in the process of uh, putting together the world's complete first uh, full-scale system and do the whole integration of these test components. That's something that you need to do in terms of the next step. So basically doing the whole integration of these tested components. And then after that, your, um, once that integration is done, we're building our first commercial line in the Emirates in Abu Dhabi. And there really you're able to get a little bit higher up to speed, right? You need to have a complete full full scale system over several kilometers to really get to the top speeds. That's, I guess, the, the answer you're, you're, you're looking for. So, so have you actually sent one of these cars through a tube yet? So you can do the testing only on scale unless you're building it completely out, right? So and if you have to build several kilometers, then, um, I mean, you have to build it first. So, but it's not, I mean, there's, there's other ways on how you can test the technology in a more stationary way. So you can test the fact that the vehicle withstands a vacuum, you can test the motors, you can, you, you can um, test the propulsion system, but the integration of the complete system is exactly what's happening right now. 
I'm sorry, just one other thing then. Do, do you have a timeline then for when you expect to build that fully integrated test so you yeah, can so, see how this works? Yeah, so it's already built in Toulouse. We have uh, our R&D center in Toulouse up. And um, we're expecting by, to finalize the overall integration next year. Uh, this is Carlos Grudzinski with the Aerospace and Aviation Council. In, in line with that question, it's key and important to do system demonstrations, and some of that is certainly tied to each project. And uh, could you speak a little bit about is that part of this project to have a demonstration within this corridor, and, and how is that important to the success of this project, if, if you can? So normally the way that we're approaching it at the moment with the commercial lines that we're building is that we have a first segment and on this first segment we're doing all the regulatory work, so certification of the system and, uh, and then we're continuing the extension. Um, that's how we're doing it right now in the Emirates and um, uh, we have another agreement in China. Um, so it, Definitely at one point depends how the regulators want to approach that, if they are willing to take over what we have done already on those systems or if they want to do that uh, again in the United States. We already are in the process of working together with the DOT on the safety guidelines. We have been working with the largest reinsurance company in the world, Munich Re. Uh, they are able to ensure the technology, which is a very important part when you're moving over to commercialization of the system. We've been working with TÜV Süd on the safety guidelines. These now are exactly those documents that we have given to the Department of Transportation in Washington, as well as the European um, uh, Council and many of the other countries that we're working with. So there's a lot of work that has been done specifically on safety and reliability of the technology in order to make sure that we're able to move forward. Because at the end, the real hurdle to overcome is the regulatory hurdle. We have time for one last one last question. Thank you very much. Hi, Christina Blobaum, uh, Kent State University, Aeronautics and Engineering. So my question is actually very simple. You're talking about these other projects. Which one has the highest probability of being completed first? So, as I mentioned before, we're now in the process of finalizing the integration in Toulouse. Uh, the project in the Emirates already has started. We have done our, the design and engineering of, uh, of the route. So and as soon as the integration in Toulouse is done, basically we're taking the same, uh, the same concept, move it over and start construction in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. Okay, great. Uh, thank you to our panel members. Let's give them a big hand. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all, and I'll turn it over, uh, back over to Dr. Kristen Eldenberger. Well, as you see, this is an exciting time for Northeast Ohio, for our communities, and for the broader Great Lakes region. Thank you again to all of our esteemed presenters. I know we have a number of esteemed elected officials here with us today in the audience that we've not been able to thank individually, um, but we greatly appreciate you being with us here today at Great Lakes Science Center. We're especially proud to have you at Great Lakes Science Center today. You may have noticed as you came in that the building's closed to the public today. Um, but as always, as your workforce partner, we are open to the youth of our community. Uh, so you may have heard our ninth graders in MC Squared STEM next door in our hallway. Um, you will also see if you go across the hall during our reception, uh, we have Euclid Park youth from, ninth, from eighth grade here in Cleveland Metro Schools on a blockchain workshop that they're here for. And upstairs we have youth from Andrew Rickoff School um, who are working on an IOT project for the day. Um, so throughout the building, we are very, very happy to support innovative technology uh, like blockchain, IOT, and this very exciting new future